It seems to get the benefits of hyperoxia, the benefits of hypoxia, without the consequences of having to push the hyperoxia too far and getting central nervous system oxygen toxicity, and without actually having to go into an, a real hypoxic event, which also has consequences. Dr. Jason Saunders here. Today, I want to go over a little bit more detail of what's being called the hyperoxia hypoxia paradox. We had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to lecture at the Longevity Fest, A4M's big December conference, and through the International Hyperbaric Association, the IHA, put together a pre-track for the conference where we did about an eight-hour introduction to hyperbarics on a lot of different topics. And uh, overall, it was a huge hit. It was a huge success. I think the doctors there had a great opportunity to learn a lot about what's going on in the field right now in terms of developments uh, in research, uh, developments in protocol, and ultimately how to apply hyperbaric for so many different types of patients with different types of health concerns. One of the things that I spoke about at that conference was the effect of hyperbaric oxygen on our epigenetics and our ability to repair the epigenome and repair DNA. And one of the concepts that comes up when we have these conversations is this hyperoxia hypoxia paradox. There was a paper, which we'll obviously link to below, that first really described what is being considered this hyperoxia hypoxia paradox, but really what it is, is that it's these periods of increased and decreased pressures of oxygen. And as pressures of oxygen increase and decrease, it seems to create an accelerated effect on our cell signal, ultimately on the cell signaling with regard to sirtuin activation, cell cycle activation, and then DNA repair, epigenetic repair, and of course, tissue regeneration. What is confusing though, is that there is never an actual amount of hypoxia. When people talk about this hyperoxia, hypoxia paradox, it's all in terms of relative hyperoxia from the normal amount of oxygen we're getting, and then relative hypoxia compared to the amount of oxygen somebody is getting while they're in the chamber. Let me try to make a little bit more sense out of this. When you're in the chamber, let's say it's an air-filled or an air-pressurized chamber, and you're breathing oxygen, let's say, through a mask. Most of the setups that we use and recommend are run this way. And so the pressure of the chamber comes from air, which is 21% oxygen. Meanwhile, the patient is breathing enriched oxygen, let's say 100% oxygen through a mask. In the old days with hyperbaric, we used to just take these things called air breaks, which meant you're breathing 100% oxygen for some period of time. But we know that too much oxygen can also create problems. There is this oxygen toxicity that we need to be aware of. And so with certain protocols, with certain intensities of oxygen, to avoid especially central nervous system oxygen toxicity, we would take these things called air breaks. And all that really means is the patient is breathing 100% oxygen for some period of time, and then we take the mask off. And because the surrounding ambient oxygen level is, is 21%, it's air, it's a break from the 100% oxygen that the patient was breathing with the mask on. What we know is that the pressure of oxygen, which is really the driving force for absorbing oxygen into our system, the pressure of oxygen is a combined effect of the pressure of the chamber multiplied by the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing. And so let's just use an example at two atmospheres, breathing 100% oxygen, that would be two ATA multiplied by 100% or multiplied by one, that gives you a PO2 of 2.0. So the pressure of oxygen in a 2.0 chamber, breathing 100% oxygen is 2.0. If you take that mask off, the pressure of oxygen drops from two atmospheres times 100% oxygen to two atmospheres times 21% oxygen and two times 0.21, 21% is 0.42. So you have a drop in PO2 from 2.0 down to 0.42. Back when these air breaks really first started, again, it had nothing to do with the therapeutic effect of the air break. It really had just to do with lowering the pressure of oxygen, giving that patient a break from the high pressure of oxygen, and giving the body a moment to really metabolize some of the excess oxygen to avoid central nervous system oxygen toxicity. As it turns out, not only is there this ability to avoid central nervous system oxygen toxicity, but in fact, there is therapeutic value, it appears, 
from taking these air breaks. So now rather than just doing them once in a while in order to prevent central nervous system oxygen toxicity, we can actually do them purposefully and maybe even more frequently as an attempt to create what we call this wave of oxygen. And could you imagine that right now we're getting what's called norm oxygen, normal oxygen. So normal pressure, I'm at sea level, we're getting a normal amount of oxygen. And if I lowered the oxygen level right now, would it make sense that if I was at normoxia, normal levels of oxygen, and I lowered the pressure of oxygen, does it make sense that I would actually become hypoxic? And so if I'm at, if I'm at normal levels of oxygen, 21% at sea level, and I'm saturating my red blood cells, and now all of a sudden I'm getting either less pressure or less of a percentage of oxygen, I could now become hypoxic, okay? Technically, 0.21 is the pressure of oxygen at one atmosphere at sea level. 0.16, a pressure of oxygen of 0.16 or below is considered hypoxia, actual hypoxia. So here I am at sea level breathing oxygen. I now lower my oxygen levels to 0.16, a PO2 of 0.16, and now I'm hypoxic. It would also probably make sense that if I'm at normoxia right now, and instead of lowering the pressure, I increase the pressure, I can now become hyperoxic. And that's what we're doing inside the chamber. When you get out of the chamber, now there's nothing to hold that oxygen inside your body. In other words, the reason you were able to absorb all the extra oxygen during hyperbaric was because of the pressure of the chamber. So when the pressure of the chamber is released, or if the percentage of oxygen is reduced, what you're doing is you're changing the pressure of oxygen. And when you change the pressure of oxygen, that oxygen tries to get out of circulation. The pressure is no longer containing it inside your body. So could you imagine that if I'm at normal oxygen and now I'm becoming hyperoxic in the chamber, when I get out of the chamber, my oxygen levels start to drop again. And if I go long enough, the worst case is I end up back to normal oxygen. The distance between hyperoxia down to normoxia is a relative hypoxic event. I have to lose oxygen in order to go from hyperoxia back to normoxia. So it's not an actual hypoxic event. It's a relative hypoxic event because you're losing the pressure of oxygen. You're losing that driving force. And as a result, oxygen's trying to escape your body. And that seems to trigger the exact same cascade of events that actual hypoxia stimulates in terms of HIF-1 alpha, in terms of VEGF and BDNF, in terms of sirtuin activation. This amount of relative hypoxia seems to be very stimulating from a healing and regenerative standpoint. And so if we combine this idea of intermittent hyperoxia back to normoxia, back to hyperoxia, back to normoxia, back to hyperoxia, back to normal oxygen, right? That wave of increased and decreased oxygen seems to create benefits regarding increased oxygen. So hyperoxic benefits like increased ATP production, increased mitochondrial performance, increased immune system activation. But it also seems to stimulate hypoxic-related pathways like the sirtuins, the HIF-1, the stem cells, the VEGF. And so by using this hyperoxia, intermittent hyperoxia hypoxia or relative hypoxia, it seems to get the benefits of hyperoxia, the benefits of hypoxia, without the consequences of having to push the hyperoxia too far, and getting central nervous system oxygen toxicity, and without actually having to go into an, a real hypoxic event, which also has consequences. And so we're able to really magnify the benefits of both hyperoxia and hypoxia while really decreasing our exposures to the consequences of either drastic measure alone. So I have this image that I've been showing as I'm talking, and this image has been pulled from the hyperoxia hypoxia paradox paper itself. So this image is from that paper, Please take a look at the link below so you can take a look at the full paper so you can also understand these details uh, the way I'm explaining them. But I'm hoping that this is just a summary of that concept. It is confusing because they use the word hypoxia and really there is no moment in time during this process where actual hypoxia is created. It's just this relative hypoxia because we're creating this wave of increased and decreased oxygen levels, stimulating hypoxic pathways 
without actually ever becoming hypoxic, okay? So again, I hope that helps. I hope that helps clarify some of the concepts, but take a look at that paper. It's a great paper in, in understanding these principles a little bit better. And uh, we look forward to next time.